they don't like about something happening in the church. And just like you, I find myself in the valley crying out to God to heal my broken heart, to remove things that have been said, and to restore my hope as I lean into him. See, friends, your title, your financial position, your age, any of those and more do not keep you from the valleys in your life. There may be seasons and pockets of your life that are really great right now. Your marriage is blessed, your kids, you know, but, but your kids, they've got uh, making some crazy and stupid decisions, right? Maybe you're close to God and you feel his presence, but in your heart, there's this constant fear of, am I going to lose my job? And maybe you're excited about the holidays, spending time with your loved ones, only to find out some really bad news maybe before. Sometimes it's like two steps forward and three steps back, right? You ever feel like that? Back into the valleys of our life. Can I take a little time here this morning and talk about God being with us in the valley? When you look at the scripture and you look at the valleys, you'll see that, that they represent several things throughout scripture. Valleys are often where the battles took place. Valleys are the seasons of desperation. They're the seasons of loneliness. But valleys are also the time of growth. You may experience God in some ways on the mountaintop, but you experience him differently in the valley. We may enjoy God in the mountaintops, but we will ultimately get to know him intimately in the valley. Let's look today at Psalm 84 as we uh, just dig into a little bit more about the valleys. Psalm 84, verses 5 through 7. It says, How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength, and every one of them appears before God in Zion. Now, the Valley of Baca, as we look at this, is, uh, was most likely related and believed to be called that because of a tree. And there was this tree in there, the valley, that would, sap, would ooze sap. I don't know if you ever, you know, like anybody get a Christmas, live Christmas tree? And by the time you take it away, you got sap all on your hands, right? And, and so that's what, through this valley, there was a, a specific tree that would ooze this sap. And if you're walking by this tree... People would have called it a weeper as it looked like the tree was crying. And because of that, the Valley of Baca is also translated as the Valley of Tears, the Valley of Weeping, and the Valley of Loss. This sticks closely to the valleys that we see throughout Scripture that are filled with thorns and wild animals. That in fact, it is very difficult to get through a valley without something bad happening. And this is why the psalmist writes... Blessed are those whose strength is found in you. This morning, you may not be a follower of Christ. And you have found yourself at the end of your rope saying that you've had enough and that you can't do anymore. You're overwhelmed and you're exhausted. In fact, if you don't know Jesus, that place of being overwhelmed and exhausted is as far as you can go. But for those of us who are Christ followers today, we believe that we have a strength that goes, goes beyond what we have. We have this access to a heavenly strength. That's why the psalmist said, blessed are those whose strength is found in you. We believe that when we get to the end of our strength, that it is there that we find his strength. One of the hardest seasons and times of my life physically, as I've shared, was when I was training for, to run for that Ohio half Ironman. And as you can see, I'm built more like a mule than I am a racehorse. And, uh, but I ran that race because I wanted to raise money for planting churches. To not only being, bringing awareness to being able to plant in cities and communities around our state, but also to encourage others that felt called to plant churches to say, listen, if this big boy can get off the couch and start running a race to do it like this, you can get up and start planting a church. Try to get up. Thank you. Thank you. I, I received that in Jesus' name. At that point in time, even for us, we had sold our house, and it was 2016, and we were, we were living in our camper, 336 square feet with, four, with three children, 
and uh, that's where we lived all the time, parked behind the church. And uh, so in the morning and the evening, my son, who was, uh, my son who was 16 at the time would go with me and we would work out at the Y or we'd run miles or we'd ride bikes or we'd do all these kind of things to train. And, and we'd get up early and do it late. But races at some point in the body, uh, while we were going on, if you've ever never done it, at some point your body says, what in the world? Why are you so stupid? You're like inhaling and, you know, you're like, what is that? That noise, that, that awful noise is probably people are along the sidelines laughing and as they're, you know, like a mule trying to run down the road. So, you know, most times it was me saying, where's a donut, right? Come on. You know, I want to do the donut run. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. But there was a drive to continue to push beyond the pain to not only dig deep, but to the drive to push beyond my own ability. This was my, this was, this was happened because my son was next to me running, swimming, or biking so many times. I mean, he had the ability to just, just go for it. And he could to like totally keep me in the dust, but no, he, he ran next to me. He was very merciful to his father, right? There was this crowd on the side encouraging you and calling out your name and cheering you on. I, I finally figured out, like, I, in some of the races, they actually had your name on your sign. And I'm like, oh, that's why, because people can cheer your name on as you get, get going down. But when you got to the end of where you're at, there was some place that you had to dig deeper within in yourself to go beyond what your mind's capability was telling you could do to be able to make it to the end. Friends, there's this strength... It's that we find at the end of our strength that we find in him and realize that his strength, we are, we are made perfect. We are, when we find his strength, we are made perfect in our weaknesses. Blessed are those whose strength is found in God. If you're in the middle uh, uh, of a race or of a valley right now, you have access to the very real, ever-present power of a good God that is available and ready to come and assist you in your time of need. Blessed are those whose strength is found in God. It didn't say, blessed are those who make it their own, those who pull up their bootstraps, those who are really determined. See, we idolize this sense in our society of independence. We want our kids, teenagers want to be independent. We want to be able to do these things in independence, but we were never created to be independent. We've always been created for, to be, have a dependence upon God. So you can get to that point. You can have your own house, your own finances, all these things, but there's a void still that can only be filled. We try to fill it with all the other stuff, with the stuff that we have, but it's a void that can only be found, be filled by the dependence upon God. When we lean in to him. Blessed are you when you realize that you're, you realize you are dependent and you have a power greater than, than yourself. Look at what the living, New Living Translation says in verse 5. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. This is good. I, I was studying this, and it says that we are on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Now, what does that mean? We may be in the valley, but we're going to what is known as the city of refuge, a place that is called the place of peace. One commentary says that to get to the city of refuge, you have to travel through the Valley of Tears. Think about that image. Sometimes to get to where you really appreciate the presence and power of God, you have to push through a little bit of the pain to get to the presence and the goodness of who God is. In essence, the valley is the pathway to the place of peace. How many times do we try to avoid the valley? But I've got to go through the valley to get to the place of the mountaintop. Friend, we, we traveled out west and I, when we first bought our motor home in, in, in 14 and, and I wanted a class A with a big window and all this kind of stuff in the front. And I can still remember going through the, the hills and everything in California and coming out overlooking Lake Tahoe, and there in that nine-foot-wide, six-foot-tall window was Lake Tahoe. And you're like, wow, 
the beauty of all it is. But it wasn't like we just skidded across the top of the, val- the mountaintops. We had to go through the valleys at times. And, you know, to, to get that little motorhome to, that motor home to go up the big valley, the mountain is like, pup, 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 pup. you know, turn on the flashers because all the people are fl- flying by us. And sometimes the valley's hard. Excuse me, I've had a little bit of a cough this morning again, so I had a mint in my mouth. See, in essence, the valley is the pathway to the place of peace. Look at that again. The joy comes from the Lord to those who have set their minds. When you think about it, the matter is that when uh, Paul said, and, and let, let me say, did, let me say, I think I missed this one or I forgot to type this in there when I was, I was looking at it. The strength comes from the Lord who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jesus, to Jerusalem. Friends, you were never meant to camp out in the valley. The valley is not your destination. The valley is just part of the process to get to where God has you and I and what he wants to do in our life. It's the refining moments of what he's doing. It's those, the places that sometimes hurt, but when we get through those things onto the other side on the, va- the mountaintop, you're like, wow. I can look back and appreciate. See, we don't appreciate when we're in the valley because it hurts, right? And sometimes it's really stinky and, and things don't, are happening in our life that we don't want them to happen. But when we get through it, we can look back and say, wow, I'm a better person or I've grown because of this or whatever it is that you put in that place because of what God has brought me through. See, it's not just about, it, it says that what happens is those that have set their minds on it. Come on, friend. It says, what you think about matters. Right. To the Colossian believers, Paul said, set your mind on things above, not on things below. To the Philippian believers, he said, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy or admirable or lovely, think about such things. Where you are is one thing, but what you think about matters. <clears throat> I've shared many times how if I lay awake at night, it's usually about the church. It's usually about finances. Truth is that my mind never really shuts down and that I'm constant thinking about this place, our call, our purpose, the things that are going on. What's the events? What's all the stuff going on? How do we reach people? How do we engage people? How do we help them grow in their faith? All these things. But even at night, the one thing that drives my wife crazy, like you'll, you'll stay awake for the church, but what about for us? What about, how, you know, whatever. But the one thing that will wake me up and keep me up is our finances and being and doing what God's called us to do. My mind will go and fear will creep in. But the one thing that calms it down is when I roll over finally and I open up my Bible app and I begin to read God's word. I refocus my mind on Jesus and unto his word. Romans 12, 2 says this, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Friends, the world says we, we worry and we do all these things and all this stuff, but, but the word of God it, it transforms our mind. If you're struggling with anxiety and fear and worry and all these things that are going on, friend, focus your mind on the word. Get in there and let his word transform who you are. What you think about really matters. Friends, your current situation may be in the valley, but your mind can still be set upon God. Your heart may be racing, but your mind, when you fix your mind on God, it, it may be, you know, the, there may be too much to do and there may be pressure with the in-laws and there may be wondering how we're going to pay for Christmas and there may be real tragedies in the valley, but to set our minds on the goodness of God because he is with you, he is for you, his spirit gives us strength when we are weak, he is the light to your feet and to your path, friends. See, you may be in the valley, but it's time to to fix your mind on him. 
alluded to this just a moment ago, but if you look at verse 6, passing through the valley of Baca, they, they make it to a spring. I like that word passing because it, it, you may be in the valley right now, but you're passing through. In other words, we, we may be in the valley right now, but this is a valley, not our destination. Where are you going? What are you doing? You can turn around and say, I am just passing through. The valley is not your home. You are journeying on to the place of peace. David wrote in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Friends, this is not just a verse that is to be spoken at a funeral, but this is a verse that we can live by, that when we are in the midst of the valley, we will fear no evil because we know the one who is standing with us. We know the one who is fighting for us. Who is going before us? Who is leading us? Friend, you may be in the valley right now, but you aren't meant to camp and stay there because you're just passing through. You may be hurting right now, but you're not going to hurt forever. You may be a place that seems dark right now, but that's not the end. I know that we don't always enjoy the valley and we don't always want to be there, but the road through the valley leads us to the place of peace, the spring. They pass through the valley of Baca, it says, and them, and they make it a spring. The King James Version writes it this way. They make it a well. They make it a place of springs. In other words, when you come to a dry place, what do you do? You dig a well. You make a well. You, you clear out a little hole as a container for the provision of rain that God is about to send. He hasn't sent it right now because you're, it's dry right now. But when you're dry and when you're hurting, you make room for the presence of God. <clears throat> That's the transformation. We don't, we don't grab a hold of the things that this world does. This world says when you're hurting, pull back and come in on yourself. And there must be something wrong with you. Friends, when we're dry and we're hurting, that's the moment we push into the Lord and we say, I'm going to dig a well because I need the provision of what God has for me. You make room for his provision. You make a well. And even when it hasn't rained yet, you prepare because you know that you stand in the hope, as Barbara and George spoke today, you have the hope and knowing that he will fill your life up. It's almost like God saying, you show me your faith and I'll show you my faithfulness. It's like him saying, if you dig it, I will fill it. If you build it, they will come. He says, if you prepare for me, I'll show up. If you show me your faith, I'll show you your faithfulness. Friends, when we come in here on Sunday mornings, do we come? To, we've got junk and garbage and everything we faced throughout the last week. But when we walk in, are we, if we're dry, are we ready to say, oh God, would you fill me up today? Do we come prepared and ready? Look at the man with the withered hand. Jesus could have said, be healed. But what did he do? He said, stretch out your hand and I will heal it. Some of you are waiting for God to do the very thing that he's asked you to do. And if you would just follow what he has said for you to do, you will see miraculous things happen right before your eyes. He has told you to give. He has told you to trust. He has told you to go, but yet you haven't. And in the midst of that, you're going to be on the other side and say, I don't know why I'm not hearing God's voice. It's because you didn't follow over here. And now he's trying to get you back to this point. Some of you were supposed to go on a missions trip. And you didn't want, oh, it's not comfortable. It's not what I want and all these things. But God said you're supposed to go and, and you decide not to go. And so it, you're just going to circle that airport another time until you get back to that place and say, God, I'm going to dig a well right here until you come and fill it. It's 
Some of you are wondering about your finances, why they're in the place. You're, you see all the stuff happening on TV and what they're saying about recession and all those things. Friends, if you trust in the economy of this world, you're going to lose it. But when we trust in the economy of God, we trust him. Listen, I drive around this parking lot and I say, God, you got a cattle on a thousand hills. It's time to sell some cattle. Let's do it. Come on. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow you. We're going to trust you. I can tell you, we, we have sat there. I, I can talk, I talk about finances because, I, because we've been there. We've done it. We stood in a circle at one point with a pastor friend who is his wife. They didn't have insurance and his, pa- his wife had this big surgery that was happening and they needed funds. And Stacy happened to be in this meeting with me that day and we were saving up for our family vacation. And we both looked at each other and kind of said, we, we, felt like, we felt like the Holy Spirit said we were supposed to put that whole thing into the pot. So we wrote a check that day and gave it to that pastor and his wife. There wasn't any giving credit or anything like that. We just gave it to God, gave it to them to honor. We're just following what God told us to do. And we're saying, well, there's our vacation for the summer. And we're going to go to Disney with our kids. But you know, within weeks... God not only met that, but did even more, provided back. And I'm sure if I went across this room and asked questions, many people could tell the the same stories of trusting God in these places and ways. And friends, let me tell you, if God can move in our hearts and our lives, he can do it in yours. Well, you're the pastor and, oh, blessed of the Lord. And I'm like, no, we're all humans. We all have flaws. We all have stuff, you know, like I I still have to put gas in my car too, just like you have to put gas in your car, right? We have to do these things. We have to trust the Lord. And and it's in those places of dry spaces in our lives. We keep trying in our own strength. But God says, listen, if you'll come back to this point, this is a word for somebody in this place today. You've been running and trying to do it on your own. And God spoke to you way back here. And listen, if you keep running, you're going to keep going further and further and further into the hole on yourself. But God is telling you, if you'll come back to this point that I spoke to you and you'll dig a well, get ready to see what I'm going to do. Everything that you wanted him to do, everything that's been in your heart's desire for your family and your finances, I really feel this is a word for somebody today. It's not even in my notes. I just sense that God is saying everything that you've tried to do with your own hands, get ready to watch him do in a moment because you've came back to the place to hear where you heard his voice last. It's a trust. It's a place of dry. And we come back to that place and say, God, would you fill it? up someone needs to hear if you dig he will fill it if you plant it he will grow it because you have to plant the seed first to see the harvest if you pray it god hears your prayer if you prepare yourself god will reveal himself friends when you're in the dry place you make a well you prepare for the presence and provision of god listen if you haven't felt the presence of god in a while it's time to dig a well already and get ready for what he's about to do and know this god reveals himself to some god god rarely reveals himself to someone that is rushed and on the run Don't dig the well. You can't have somebody else dig your well. You got to dig your well and then move on and and just run and try to get ahead of it. Moses, when he he saw the burning bush, didn't just sit in his car and snap a couple pictures and post it to his Instagram and say, I was here and we'll go on the way. Listen, I went to I went to uh, New, uh, what is it Washington D.C. when the Toledo Rockets were playing over there against Navy several years ago, and and we saw Jared, my friend Jared and I we went over we we had like we were gone for 48 hours we were in Washington D.C. for like 34 hours including two sleeps and we saw like 
30 some you know museums and exhibits and we would just hop out take our picture and be like all right let's move on and go on and that's what we're here we're here we're here but Moses when he was at that moment he saw the burning bush what did God say to him take off your sandals because this ground is holy friends stop trying to run and this is Pastor Josh preaching to himself right now too. Let's dig the well where we are. Let's take off our sandals. Let's relax in this place. Our shoes and relax, not relax, but let's wait on the Lord. So if we're dry, he wants to fill you up today. He wants to fill your well if you're in the middle of the valley. Friend, dig a well and be still and wait upon him. It says, if you seek me, you will find me. If you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. Can I tell you that I'm in the valley and when I'm in a place that seems like everything is crashing around me, that I've most recently found myself, in the, in the last little season, I find myself that I can begin to cry fairly easily. Tears going down my cheeks. That it's in those places where I need God to intervene, not just in the situation, not just in what's happening, but I need him to intervene inside of me. I'm convinced that the situations that you and I are in isn't because God just wants to change the situation, but that he wants to get a hold of our hearts, to find our strength being in him as we focus our minds and our hearts on him. See, God never promised that we wouldn't go through the valley. He promised that you would never go through the valley alone. Grant, if you guys will come. God with us. And the virgin will be with a child and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Look at how the psalmist finishes this portion of scripture in Psalm 84. They go from strength to strength. Friends, it is not our our strength, but we get to experience his strength. Some of you are fighting the valley, the battles in the valleys with your own strength, and that is not the plan and purpose of God. You are tired, you are worn out. That's because you were never called to fight the battle on your own. You may have the ability to stand for a season, but that doesn't make you some awesome and amazing person. The real value of who you are is when you come to the end of your strength, what's there? What do you find? When you're at the end of your rope, what do you find? Are you exhausted or do you find him? Friend, right now you may feel weak, but who is God? He is in the middle of your weakness. Can I ask you today, is he your strength? That even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that you will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with us. Who is he? He is Emmanuel, God with us. Friends, I don't know if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal savior. But today, if you're in the midst of a valley, if you're by yourself, he desires to be God with you. He desires to be your savior, your guide, your friend, your pulling through whatever you're going through in your life. This morning, he wants to meet you. And for those of you who are followers of Jesus in this place, that maybe today you've been focusing so much on the valley and all the things going on around it that it's time to set your mind on him. Is your mind just on getting stuff around the Christmas tree? Is it just about what you don't have? Friends, what if you change your mindset to say, look what I do have. Look who I have in my life today. That our focus is upon him. It's upon what he wants to do. That our trust is in what God is able to do in and through your life today. This morning, these guys are going to sing, and I think just the song we sang earlier about Emmanuel, God with us. 
Our closing this morning is just an opportunity for you to come. And if it's this morning that you want to give your life to Jesus, I'd love to lead you in the beginning of what's a prayer. That's only the beginning. That's not the end. You say a prayer and that's the end. No, it's the beginning. But for some of you in this room today, you're in the valley and your focus has been on the valley and it's time to focus in on him. Your destination is not the valley. Your destination is the mountaintop, close to him, to be by him, to hear his voice. And maybe today you're in the valley and you're dry and you need to dig a well. You know what it begins with? You coming to the front. There's nothing magical about this space. <coughs> but the altar throughout scripture is a place where we go and we lay ourselves down or we stand before it and we say, God, here I am. If you can use anybody, use me. God, I need to see you, hear you move today in my heart, in my life. I need your presence in my life again. Maybe you need hope that we talked about this morning. Maybe whatever it is, Holy Spirit would tweak within you and speak to you that some of you need to come and dig a well. Dig a, dig a, a, a well. And some of you need to confess the sin that you've been running and running and running and you need to go back to that place where he spoke to you and say, God, here I am, I'm listening. Speak to me again. As they sing this morning, I want to welcome you to come. I want to welcome you to respond this morning and to see what God does in the midst of your heart, in the midst of your life. Don't wait for somebody else. Come on. If this spoke to you, what you need to do, come and respond this morning. Come to the front, find a space. If you need to sit on the front row, do that. Come on, don't just sit and watch. Let's make this season be what God's meant it to be in your heart, in your life.
to respond, I want to invite you to come. If you still need to respond to the altar, I want to invite you to come and respond this morning. And we'll, we'd love to pray for you and encourage you and, and to pray with you. But if your time, if you're done, you're welcome to go today. Be blessed. We'll see you this Wednesday night for classes or uh, next Sunday morning. Be blessed. Otherwise, uh, if you want to come for prayer, please do. If not, be blessed. Have a great day. Thank you for being here.